You're listening to Harris Smith Radio, Episode 10. Hey there, I'm your host, Wayne McPhail. The recent wildfires in California, which we've mentioned before in this podcast, taught sun-soaked citizens of that state an important lesson. Don't trust the grid. That and keep canned beans, batteries, and fresh water in the basement. We start this episode talking about living off that grid with Canada's handyman, Steve Maxwell. Then, on a lighter note, but with no less energy, I speak with Signe Langford, Harrismith's food editor, about alternatives to coffee on cold winter nights. I even learn about pea and oat milk. That's not really milk. By the way, if you want to read Harrismith Magazine instead of listen to it, you can subscribe to the print version online at harrismithmagazine.com. And you can find Harrismith Magazine on selected newsstands across Canada. But for now, settle in for the next half hour of Harrismith Radio. Steve Maxwell is the kind of guy who puts other guys to shame. He can build decks, juggle power tools like a circus performer, and drywalls like a champ. The guy in Home Depot who's so helpful, he probably watches Steve's videos in his spare time. This time out, Steve and I talk about how you can go off the grid. It involves babying batteries, reading the manual, and ditching your electric stove. Here's our chat. I wanted to talk about getting off the grid, and I think that from what I've been reading about what your advice is, one of the first things we should be talking about is if you want to move from the electrical grid to solar or wind, the first thing you need to do is take stock of what your electrical uses are right now, right? Yes, that's a very important step, and there's a couple of reasons. First of all, because most of us have access to the electrical grid, our electricity consumption as a, as a nation really has, has inched upwards. Uh, we keep getting new things, new appliances, you know, air conditioning is more widespread, and so it's actually very surprising how much energy we use, electrical energy, and how challenging that can be to meet those needs strictly off-grid without any sort of conservation efforts being applied. One excellent way to begin the exercise of finding how much energy you use now is to look at your electricity bill, if you have one, you know, assuming you're connected to the grid. Now, those numbers, kilowatt-hour consumption numbers, will be a great starting point to decide how much you're using, what size of off-grid system you would need to match that consumption, you know, and do your calculations from there. But the bottom line is that even though off-grid energy systems have become much more affordable over the last 10 years or so, it still can be fairly expensive to install. So this is why conservation is, is the, really an important place to start. So we've really gotten spoiled over the years, right? Very much so. And, you know, the, the thing to understand, too, is that there's, there's two kinds of spoiling that's happened here. First of all, there's the spoiling of being able to use vast quantities of electrical energy. Uh, but the energy picture has another facet, too. It's, it's not just how much electricity you use, but it's how much your peak demand might be. So, for instance, a window air conditioner doesn't look like a very big deal, but that window air conditioner will draw a huge amount of electricity when it starts. So some things draw a lot more power during startup. So you not only have to develop your system so that it can handle the total quantity of energy that you want to consume in, say, a month, but also to be able to handle the, the peak load, which can be uh, quite dramatic for a very short period of time. Now, the good news is that with today's conservation options and proper planning, uh, anybody can live a fully modern lifestyle completely off-grid with uh, a system that will provide power for them almost all the time. I, and I know people that do this. And I've, uh, you know, I've created a course on, uh, on how to design and install your own off-grid electrical system. And that's based on people that are actually doing this. And they're not just lighting a light bulb either. They've, they've got uh, central heating. They've got running water. Uh, they've got lights, workshops, the whole thing. But they are configured to be as economical as possible. That's, that's really the key. Okay, so first step, take stock, realize that you're spoiled, try to get rid of some of the stuff. Like a, one of the things, another one would be like an electrical stove, right? If you had electrical stove, you might want to think to move to, you know, propane or natural gas, right? Exactly. You know, once you get down to the brass tacks of economizing, 
Uh, what this means is usually two things. I mean, first of all, you want to eliminate as many heat-related loads as possible because heat takes a lot of power. So, like you say, an electrical range, you know, you could do that with off-grid energy, but it would be massively expensive and unnecessary because any one of us can have a natural gas or propane range. Same goes with a dryer. Most dryers are fully electrically powered, but there are versions that, uh, that use propane or natural gas to create the actual heat that dries the clothes and just a, a relatively small amount of electricity to run the, the drum and, the, and the, you know, the, the on-off controls and temperature settings and things like that. So anything that you can do to eliminate heat-related loads from your system, uh, you will be much better off. So once you've done all that and you decided you want to get off the grid, it strikes me there's a couple of options, right, that you can go off the grid in the sense that you are self-contained, that you have electricity regardless of whether you're connected to the grid or not, or you can also do a system where you're feeding energy back into the grid. Um, can we talk about the two different options there? Well, in, in a sense, there, there are the two options that you're mentioning, but they really they really shake down into three different choices that you have available. Um, there is the first one where you're, you're completely off-grid. Uh, you're not connected to the grid in any way. You probably don't have a grid connection nearby, and all your electrical energy is provided by your system. So that's one option. Uh, another option would be to have a system that is connected to the grid in some way. This would be what they call a grid-tied system. And because of various government programs in, in different places over the last 10 years or so, a fair number of people have, have gone a grid-tied option. And that means the electricity they produce can be fed back into the grid for a, a credit. So in a sense, your electrical meter runs backward when you're producing more power than you're consuming. A lot of those grid-tied systems don't actually provide energy independence. They just provide a, an opportunity for you to automatically sell excess power back into the grid. So that means that when the power goes down, if you have a system that is only grid-tied, then you're out of power too. And even though you have the capability to produce power by wind and sun, if the system is only tied to the grid, then uh, you don't have any power. So that's so exactly what happened in California, right? With the California fires, the grid goes down. People who have a system like that, a grid-tied system, suddenly they're without power as well. They've got no advantage to the fact that they've got solar and wind at, at that point, right? Right, and, and I, I imagine some of them uh, might have been uh, fairly disappointed <laughs> when they discovered right. that because it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. You, you can also design a system that is, is grid-tied when the grid is up but also provides some measure of power for you when the grid goes down. So in that sense, it's kind of a hybrid version of the completely off-grid system and the grid tied. The two can be put together. Now, the, the grid tied system, I would assume, is kind of uh, cheaper and less hassle-free and less I need to be a handyman and able to do this, right? Very much so. You know, one of the things to keep in mind, I'm glad you, you, you brought this up because one of my goals in educating people about off-grid energy systems is to be completely honest and, and upfront about things. And we're not to the stage now where an ordinary person who is completely technically illiterate will be able to live with an off-grid energy system just as they do the grid now. There are some tinkering things that need to happen, and it's not onerous, and it's not a, a difficult thing to do. And I'm not talking about the, the know-how to install the system. I'm just talking about the little bit of knowledge that you need in order to operate that. It, it's very important to, to ask yourself whether you really want to do this or not, not to discourage people, but just to be upfront about what you're going to run into. So, for instance, as you, as you mentioned, a completely grid-tied system can be pretty automatic. I mean, there's not really a lot to think about there and a lot to control because your solar and wind system will automatically be feeding power back into the grid and you really don't have any, anything to do. But if you have a, 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 an off-grid capable system, well, in addition to the solar panel and windmill, uh, you're also going to have to have a, a bank of batteries because you might want power in the middle of the night when there's no wind. And, uh, batteries provide that energy storage. But management of batteries 
does take a little bit of diligence if you want them to last a long time. And ultimately, too, if you want to go completely off-grid, if you want to be, have the capability of being completely independent of the rest of the world, electricity-wise, any off-grid system should also include some kind of a generator backup. Now, that's not because you necessarily need that all the time, but when you have a, an extended period of time where there's no wind and it's cloudy in the middle of winter and things, your batteries are going to run down, and you're probably still going to want to have power. So the generator, the, the backup generator system can kick in, and it can provide power when your system has run out of juice, so to speak. And uh, also, probably more importantly, having a backup generator means that your batteries never need to be discharged past the point of damage. One of the things that, that, that's very important is that you try to get the most working life out of your battery. Because and battery let's just, spent- just stop there for a second. I just want to be sure. clear with folks because I think that some people, and certainly me before I started looking into this, thought these days a battery for a, a solar system, for example, or a wind system, would be something like a, a Tesla battery or a lithium ion that's in a, a camera or a cell phone um, because those right. are sort of modern and they're small and they're powerful and that's really cool. But I think you, when you're talking about batteries, for this kind of system, you're really talking still about old lead-acid battery technology, right? Uh, Yes. Now, uh, battery technology is advancing quickly, and the whole electric car phenomenon has provided a motivation for manufacturers to build large lithium-ion batteries. Lithium-ion battery technology is wonderful. Uh, We wouldn't have the kinds of cell phones we have. We wouldn't have laptops with many hours of runtime. We, we wouldn't have power tools as great as we do now if it was not for lithium-ion battery. And there are some big ones out there now because, you know, like you say, a test was big on lithium-ion. Uh, all, all the electric vehicle manufacturers are pushing in that direction because lithium-ion technology is, offers tremendous opportunities and potential. However, when you're talking about an off-grid energy system, at the moment, the biggest bang for your buck, as far as batteries go, still is with lead acid of one sort or another. I mean, there are a couple of different versions of the lead acid scenario, but bottom line is, if you, in terms of how much battery storage capacity you get for how much it costs you, lead acid, the old standby lead acid, is, is still the battery of choice at the moment. Now, five years from now, that might be different. I, I do know of people that are salvaging lithium-ion batteries from Tesla cars and using them in off-grid energy systems. I don't think that would pay if you went out and, and bought one battery pack for a Tesla car brand new and, and used it in your off-grid system. But if you can find one that's in decent condition, the economics of that completely changes. So, But at the moment, uh, if you're starting from scratch and you don't have any special connections to old, you know, old Tesla batteries, then uh, lead acid is the way to go. They do need to be treated properly. Yes. Now that's what that's just what I was going to ask about that that I think that some people might think well you know lead acid batteries I'm going to spend all this money and have this battery array and then it's going to be like a dead car battery in five years and I'm just going to be starting all over again. Well, that is in fact a very realistic danger, but it doesn't have to be that way. It really comes down to the management of the state of charge of the battery. So I'll give you an example. The oldest continuously operating off-grid energy system I know of was set up by a couple more than 20 years ago. They wanted to build uh, a retirement home in the country along a lake. They were 10 miles from the nearest hydro line. Uh, It was going to cost them more than $350,000 to have that line extended to their new place, and and they didn't want to pay that. So they created, and this is more than 20 years ago, they created an off-grid energy system that allows them to live a completely modern lifestyle. And the batteries, the original lead-acid batteries that were put into that system when new are still operating perfectly today. That's a long time. And the reason they've lasted that long is because the people in charge are, are very careful to never let the batteries discharge more than 20% of their total capacity. So that means they're, they're only letting the state of charge get down to 80% of the maximum. And if you do that, then batteries can last a very, very long time. Now, usually the rule of thumb is never let the batteries drop down below 
50%. But this, you know, 80% to 50%, I mean, there are some gains to be made there in terms of battery longevity. Once you get down below 50% charge in a lead-acid battery, uh, you're starting to do some damage. And when I say damage, I mean reducing the ability of the battery to hold electricity, to hold energy, if you don't monitor battery charge, you can have extremely short battery life. I know of a, a provincial park near where I live in Ontario. They're a long way from the grid. They could have connected to the grid if they wanted, but they decided, you know, it's a provincial park, we want to be green, let's go with an off-grid system, and they installed that. So uh, most of the energy was used at an interpretive center, and that was manned by students during the summer who didn't really know about off-grid energy systems, and they regularly ran the system down to nothing. And so tens of thousands of dollars of batteries were toast in five years. I have enough trouble keeping my laptop above 50 percent, so it's, <laughs> it's, right? it's hard to imagine an entire house. So I want to, just thinking of cost and, and buying stuff, I just want to end off by just talking about, it, it strikes me given the internet and given, the, as you mentioned, manufacturers sort of exploring this area, especially around batteries, is this becoming, for, for folks that have some ability to tinker, is this becoming commoditized? Can you sort of go onto Amazon and buy yourself a kit to do this? Or, or how? what's involved if you wanted to sort of jump into this? Well, that's a great question. Uh, and there are kind of a couple of options. Your main question is, is this whole off-grid energy thing being commoditized? And it is. You know, and by that, I mean the ability to create a, a system is becoming more modular, for instance. The systems are, uh, the components are now simpler to connect to each other than ever before. The products work better, they're more sophisticated, they're more efficient, they just do a better job. So this is actually a great time to consider an off-grid energy system. You mentioned a moment before about you having trouble keeping your laptop above 50 percent. Well, one of the advancements that we enjoy now are systems that will automatically take care of that sort of thing. For instance, if you have a backup generator and wind and, and sun fails to keep that battery above the 50% level, well, the system can be configured to have the generator kick on automatically and to, to do that recharging for you. So it, it's much more turnkey than it was, but still, a little bit of tinkering is an important thing. Now, you can, when I say tinkering, you, you can tinker at the most basic level. So you're buying solar panels, buying an inverter, a charge controller, a wind turbine, and you're connecting all these things together, you're figuring out what you need, you're making the wire connections, uh, all that's possible and more doable than ever. But at the other end of the spectrum, there are professionals out there who will do all that for you. So you're essentially telling them what you want, telling them what you expect in terms of energy output, and then they do all the legwork for you. So uh, there's quite a spectrum there. Now, in either case, though, it really pays to know what's going on. And, and when I say know what, what's going on, understand the technology, understand how the different components work together. Most importantly, understand how to calculate what your actual off-grid energy needs will be. Total quantity of energy storage, how much peak output your system will be able to provide. This is a great example of where knowledge is important in order to get a good outcome. Right. And it's important to read the manual. Well, it is. And, you know, and there's lots of different manuals. You just have to pay attention, essentially. We're not at the point where off-grid energy systems are as turnkey as, as picking up a landline and making a call. There's information that you need to know to understand. And you know, with that in, in hand, you can enjoy a lot of energy independence. Right. Now, you mentioned early on about the couple that uh, 20 years ago created the, the system, and it was going to cost them $350,000 to run a, a line to their place. So roughly, are we talking to, to do a system for, say, a, a couple like that these days? Are we, are we talking $100,000, $50,000? What's, what sort of the ballpark are we thinking about? The answer to that question it begins with the word depends, because there are some people, I know a, a couple, for instance, very close to my home here, they have, this is not the couple that did this 20 years ago, but they have a, a seasonal cottage completely off the grid, and they're very frugal in their energy use. So their system only handles lights and a small water pump uh, when they want to use some kind of heat producing thing like make a cup of coffee in the morning they have a little generator they hook up so well it's actually already hooked up but they use that little generator so 
if you're very frugal, you can get a system for you know several thousand dollars. You could put together quite a nice little system with batteries. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, if you want to run your whole house, you're looking at, at quite a bit more money than that. Now, the rule of thumb is that for each installed watt of capacity, you're looking at two to three dollars. So, for instance, if you wanted a system that could provide up to 5,000 watts of output, so 5,000 watts of electrical consumption at any given time, 5,000 times three, that's $15,000. So now, just to put that in, into, into perspective, this couple that made the system 20 years ago, uh, they actually have a total of 10,000 watts of capacity. So they have 5,000 watts in their home, 5,000 watts in a workshop. So 10,000 watt total, if we were installing that system today, maybe $30,000. You know, 10,000 times three. When they installed the system, it cost, and this is 20 years ago, it cost $80,000. 80,000 20 year old dollars, but that's actually maybe more like 100 or over 100. Right. So that gives you an indication of how things have gotten more economical. So it's getting more economical, it's getting a little bit more commoditized, but we still have to be a bit of a tinkerer, need to pay attention to our energy needs, need to pay attention to the system itself, and uh, have sort of realistic expectations of what's possible for the amount of money we want to spend on it. Is that a, a good summary of where we're at right now? Yes, it is. I think that's, a, that's a very accurate summary. Great. Well, thanks very much for uh, taking the energy to uh, to share with us today. Oh, my, my pleasure, Wayne, and uh, and I hope we've provided some value for people. You certainly have. Thank you, sir. That was Steve Maxwell, who probably did this whole interview on a single double A. Signe Langford is a chef and food writer who knows her way around food and drink any hour of the day. So when I wanted to talk to someone about alternatives to coffee on a cold winter's night, who else was I going to call? She offers up some odd milks and a matcha made in heaven. Here's our fireside chat. If you want to avoid coffee completely, I think some of the lovely drinks to bring out for guests, That one of my favorite is, of course, a chai latte. That's an acquired taste. Not everybody likes all those exotic sort of East Indian flavors uh, in their teas, but I actually really do love it. And it really, to me, they are Christmas uh, holiday flavors. They're cinnamon and ginger, I mean, nutmeg. These are all flavors I associate with this time of year anyway, so that's really good. A matcha latte, and matcha is, I'm sure most of our listeners know, is the pale, lovely, lovely pea green powder of green tea. It's kind of expensive because it's uh, the finest tips are used and it's very pure and very concentrated. Japanese Matcha or sencha are, are both green teas, but matcha's the powder. It makes a beautiful latte. I mean, just the color alone is quite stunning. It's just such a bright green. And so those are two of my favorites, chai and matcha. But I like a bit of honey in matcha, and honey is the flavor that complements the, the green tea the best. When you <laughs> add the, the milk, it yeah. creams it up. And if you've ever had... At the end of a Japanese meal or sushi, a dish of green tea ice cream, imagine that hot. And that's what it tastes like. And I think that's delightful. A London Fog is a great drink if you like Earl Grey. But then, you know, I know people who think Earl Grey tastes like someone spilled a bottle of perfume into the tea. Because it is very aromatic and perfumed. But um, a London Fog is lovely with a little bit of vanilla, a little bit of honey, your, your frost milk. So that's a good alternative. Of course... Getting away from any of those teas and, and coffees and even chocolates, I love a mulled apple cider. I mean, I think that is the most delightful drink. Um, and when I say apple cider, yep. I don't mean the hard stuff. I mean soft apple cider or like that raw apple juice you can buy in the jug. Just put that in a pot, heat that up, toss a cinnamon stick or two in there, some fresh ginger slices, a little bit of nutmeg, and let that simmer very low until it's drawn out some of the flavors from the ginger and cinnamon. Just like that, 
it's beautiful. But here's how I like to serve it as a really special thing, like an after dinner or afternoon uh, special drink. Put it in little teacups and add a splash of... Now, this is, don't ask me to, do not ask me to spell this. There's a liqueur from, I think, Austria called Apfelkorn. Gosh, it's delicious. And it's an apple liqueur, and it is fantastic. And you put a drop of that in to a cup with the hot mulled apple cider, and then a dollop of whipped cream on top, and another little grating of cinnamon and nutmeg, and you know what it tastes like? It tastes like a liquid piece of apple pie. It is so good. Excellent. So good. Okay, you sold okay. me on that one. You haven't sold me on the matcha yet, but you sold Dang. me on that one. Okay. So let's, let's, so let, let's end off, because you were just talking about stuff that, that doesn't have milk in it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of, you know, you can see even in Tim Hortons these days, there's there's almond milk and all sorts that's of right, stuff that's milk. That's right, the alternative milk. Uh, the non-dairy yeah. milks. Um, I've been looking at all the different kinds, and every day there seems to be a, a, another type of quote-unquote milk. I like to spell that one M-Y-L-K. The one I'm seeing being used in my local coffee shop is oat milk. Uh, I had a latte made with oat milk because I generally avoid dairy milk myself, and I and I like soy milk. But some folks are sensitive to soy, and some folks don't want to get the phytoestrogens that are in soy. But oat milk was creamy and toasty and really nice in the coffee. I got to say, the oat milk was good, and it foamed up quite nicely. It was very, very thick and luscious. Soy milk doesn't foam so beautifully. Almond milk is okay. I like the flavor of almond milk. Um, I find rice milk is a bit odd. Don't care for it. Actually, the, the latest one I've seen on the store shelves, haven't tasted it yet, is this pea milk. So it's made with peas, yellow peas, like a yellow lentil. And um, right. it's supposed to be really great. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, this pea protein is what they use in the, uh, you know, the Impossible Burgers or the Beyond Beef Burgers. This is this pea protein right. that's very mimicking of animal protein. So I have high hopes for the, the milk, too, which I'm definitely going to try as soon as I see one that isn't flavored because I've seen butterscotch and chocolate and I just want plain to try it. Oh, yeah, that oh, sounds... You're killing me. You're no, killing me. You're killing me. Um, oh, hemp okay. milk is great. Uh, hemp is really great for us. And of course, it is it is the wave of the future um, for so many things from fibers to, you know, fabrics to pulp and paper, medicinal, everything. Hemp is brilliant and the little hemp hearts are delish in salads and things. So the milk is also great. Definitely try some alternatives. But if you are looking for a lovely, you know, sort of digestif after dinner, nothing better. If you still have some mint in your garden, go get that. Pour some hot water over it. Put a spoonful of honey. That's the that's the best. There's truly that is absolutely wonderful. You can do the same with fresh ginger. Yeah, and and it's a good way to end the segment. And thank you very much for your advice on all those. My things. pleasure. That was Signe Langford, who's probably already working on a pea milk eggnog as I speak. So, here we are at the end of this episode of Harris Smith Radio. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing to this podcast on Apple iTunes or in your favorite podcast player. And please, tell your friends and family. Got feedback? We'd love to hear it. You can email us at letters at harrismithmag.com. That URL, harrismithmag.com, is also where you can order subscriptions online. And you can find Harrismith Magazine on selected news stands across Canada. Until next time, for Harrismith Radio, I'm Wayne McPhail. And also, until next time, remember these four words. Make, grow, sustain, share. Tune in for the next episode of Harrismith Radio.